So then please, uh, not please you, but uh, we should uh, now uh, check our motivation for being here, listening to the teachings and arouse this intention to uh, attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings and to engage in the practices of the conduct of a bodhisattva, in particular the six paramitas, in order to uh, bring that about. So we are right now in the uh, fifth chapter of Shanti Deva's uh, text of the way of the Bodhisattva, the Bodhicharya Avitara. And um, just to review the context, in the first three chapters, we learned how to uh, clarify, uh, to purify our mind and gather the, the wholesome qualities that would allow bodhicitta to take birth in our mind, as well as the uh, in the third chapter, the actual uh, taking of those of that of those uh, vows and then in the uh, fourth fifth and sixth chapters Shanti Deva is teaching how to prevent those uh, prevent bodhicitta both the aspiration bodhicitta and engaging bodhicitta and all the trainings that go along with those uh, vows, how not to allow, not, how not to allow all of, all of that to become, to degenerate, to be lost, uh, as it will for uh, beginners like, like ourselves. And so, uh, of course, even I mean, Shanti Deva. The premise that Shanti Deva was basing his these three chapters on was that just giving rise to bodhicitta, just having this intention and making these commitments uh, doesn't ensure that they will be. Uh, accomplished, that we will attain enlightenment just because we uh, give rise to, the, to the, uh, these two kinds of bodhicitta uh, once or even once a day or every once in a while we give rise to bodhicitta, but that, uh, but that they will, this intention will become, uh, will decline or become scattered or forgotten or corrupted. It's almost, it's assumed that that will occur. And so we should, uh, as we proceed in our spiritual life, then we should assume also that, that that is what will happen. And by studying and reflecting on and carrying out the different meditations that Shanti Deva is presenting, then that bodhicitta will uh, not decline. The, well, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, there's four ways that our uh, bodhicitta will 
decline or what would be called the four downfalls in maintaining the precepts of the bodhisattva path. And one is uh, not knowing uh, the training, not knowing how to correct or not knowing how to practice what will prevent uh, downfalls. And the other one, the second, uh, what are called um, door, doors of downfalls, uh, is uh, to be uh, heedless. Of course, heedlessness, being heedless is what's covered in the fourth chapter that we finished. And then the third door of downfalls is that um, presently we have more clashes than we do uh, qualities, like say, or we, that our bodhicitta is far outweighed by our clashes. So we should accept that and let that uh, kind of make us more, how do I say, accepting uh, and to also, especially as we read this, as we study this uh, fifth chapter, mindfulness and or introspection, uh, to really take it personally take it as uh, personal instructions for someone like us. It's not just learning doc the doctrine, the Buddha's doctrine, you know, like the Mahayana doctrine. That's not the point. The point is to uh, apply as we can these instructions so that our kleshas will become fewer and fewer. The fewer kleshas, the more wisdom. That's the formula that we're working with. And then the fourth, what are called the fourth door of downfalls is knowing the training, but not really respecting or not, not relating to it in, in the way that would uh, allow it to work, not not really uh, kind of discounting the the training. Uh, so we should know, kind of be on the be on the lookout or be on guard for these uh, four uh, gates, and make up make up for them with studying and being careful and heedful and uh, noticing a profusion of kleshas as is outlined in the uh, previous verses when we went went over those and then uh, uh, practicing to the best of our ability so that we feel as though the practice actually landed on our mind and that we can feel uh, at least some some traction from the application of the teachings. Then our enthusiasm and and uh, respect and devotion to the practice will will pick up. Uh, but again, like it, like we mentioned many times earlier on in the third chapter. Uh, the bodhisattva path has to be seen or has to be practiced in a very gradual way. Small, small steps, a very gradual way. That's how it will uh, actually begin to land on our mind more and more, not just some sort of sudden, sudden uh, I call it sudden life. Now, suddenly he's changing our lifestyle or something. That's not how we should relate to this. 
on how we should practice. We should practice in small increments. Um, okay, so then in this the vigilant introspection, the introspection uh, chapter, uh, these are the, just as in the earlier chapter, there's the, it was the paramita of generosity in the first, the first and second, the second and third chapters. And then in this chapter, the hatefulness or carefulness and vigilant introspection is how to practice the uh, paramita of uh, discipline. And so we've, as you know, if you looked into the way that the paramitas are generally uh, taught in sort of a threefold manner, then in the paramita of, for instance, generosity, there's the generosity of material, the giving of material uh, goods, uh, the giving of, uh, of protection, and the giving of dharma. Uh, sort of in the order of capacity. First, our capacity is to give material uh, things to others. And then secondly, as we develop more uh, qualities of uh, not clinging, then we're able to offer protection to others. And because of the trust that others may feel and then uh, and at a certain point then one can offer the Dharma and here in discipline then there's the first discipline of the Bodhisattva is the uh, discipline of uh, abandoning negative actions Uh, which is what we've been, what Shantideva has been discussing up to this point. All the teachings up to this point uh, are about first, the, the chapter began by uh, giving us a reflection on how all uh, harm comes from our own mind and then how all virtue comes from our own mind. And that uh, the basis of all bodhisattva activity is the mind, not, not, not speech and body so much, but mind. And how we need to keep watch over our mind. And as far as noticing our mind, see if we begin by reflecting on how all uh, outer harm comes from our mind, how uh, negativity is our mind, how, and how virtue comes from our mind. We, all these uh, reflections that are taught at the outset of this chapter are all uh, sort of, uh, it's, it's how we begin to notice our mind, to notice our mind and notice the power of our mind. And then all those, the itemization of all of the afflictions, kind of tune, fine tunes more of how we, uh, can, how we see and relate to our mind. We want to see our afflictions. We want to see our faults. This is the Bodhisattva path. Uh, and then uh, he also then discussed how we should be aware of the drawbacks of having uh, a lack of introspection. So it's, it's this uh, 
mindfulness and uh, introspection are, are, are tools uh, that allow us to notice our mind just as it is. We can become very fixated on attaining enlightenment and relate to ourselves as ones who are on the bodhisattva path, uh, but we won't really accomplish much if we don't then begin the training of the bodhisattva, which, as it turns out, is to notice our mind and its afflictions. If we don't, speaking in terms of a gradual progress on our spiritual path, if we don't take things like in this order, then all of our efforts at practicing virtue and all the uh, all the you know qualities of compassion and wisdom that we aspire to uh, will just they'll just be like uh, you know, kind of water spilled that they, they won't go in they won't go in water spilled on a on a piece of glass uh, we need to do the the underlying work of noticing and relating to our afflictions in a in a positive way note what do you say uh, working with negativity in a positive way. And that is by applying this mindfulness and introspection and then uh, applying it according to Shanti Deva's advice here. So now, uh, let's see, we've gotten up to uh, page of uh, the uh, 40, 59th verse uh, and the last verse in 58 again is the same uh, uh, theme of of being always uh, aware of and reflecting on this precious human life we have and in the previous chapter if, as you when you review the previous chapter there's uh, many verses uh, about about the uh, precious human birth and how it's the perfect uh, vehicle for, uh, for the path, for the Dharma path. And so again, at, on page on uh, verse 58, he, he uh, advises again on that. And then on 59 begins the uh, section on uh, the discipline of gathering virtue, how to gather virtue. 59. And uh, and so just to give you a, again a little bit of context for this section, this is, uh, let's see, verse 59 to seven, uh, seven, uh, 69, I think, Six, 70. Um, that's what we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a one section. Uh, one of the uh, principal reasons, we could say the basic reason that, that uh, bodhisattva conduct is difficult A virtuous conduct is virtuous conduct. It's, it's doing positive virtuous actions. Bodhisattva virtuous conduct is doing those actions with this bodhicitta attitude. And putting those two things together is difficult. Of course, by virtue by itself is difficult, isn't it? Uh, so one of the, uh, the basic obstacles or like say difficulties is attachment to our body. 
as we learned in the second chapter, like the foundation of self-clinging is our body, (laughs) our possessions, and our virtue, attachment to body, attachment to possessions, attachment to virtue. Uh, And so again here, this theme is picked up again, or that problem is picked up again. Uh, and so the uh, in on the Bodhisattva practice using this introspection uh, this attachment to our body is one of the uh, basic uh, habits it's it's a thought it's a habit a mental habit that is to be overcome. And it's overcome by uh, applying these um, meditations on and from verse 59 to 70. Uh, here in the previous verse 58, Shanti Dev is saying, okay, never forget that you have this precious human birth. And now he's saying, basically, that there's a problem with that. And the problem is that we're attached to this human body that we have. So it's kind of a, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting. Uh, the difference between never forgetting and always reflecting and, and getting more and more uh, meaning out of our human life because of its qualities on the one hand, and then being told that, well, there's a problem with being attached to our bodies, on the other hand. Uh, And here he says, so basically, we need our body to practice. Our body is the vehicle to practice. So we should remember we're not taking that away from our body. That is the main point of that reflection on the preciousness of of our human body is that that we need that to practice the Dharma, but we don't need to be attached to it. Uh, The body through attachment, our body can become the main thrust of our life. And of course, for I don't know how many people, perhaps, uh, I mean, that is uh, for people who are non, not Dharma people, it is the main thrust of their life. It is the main purpose of life. Uh, but here we are trying to make mind become the, the make our body become the servant of our mind, not the other way around. Uh, being overprotective and pampering our bodies, our thoughts. This being overprotective and. Uh, and indulging in our body's uh, pleasures or feelings uh, are just thoughts. And so here he's presenting a meditation that challenges those habitual thoughts with what are called uh, remedial thoughts. And if we can, let's say in proportion to the lessening of our attachment to our body will be our lack of difficulty in practicing virtue. And virtue won't be so irritating. We get irritated to be, to practice virtue, to be 
generous and so forth. And so that that is uh, rooted in this uh, attachment to our body, attachment to our comfort zone. And so as we if we engage in these meditations, these are actual meditations, uh, then our uh, then we won't sort of uh, crumble in the face of of uh, trying to practice virtue. That's why these are so important to go underneath and gradually work on our mind not just to take on these huge virtuous responsibilities and then uh, not do the work underneath that. Okay, so I want to, we should make that clear. Okay, so then he says here, if, O mind, you will not be aggrieved when vultures with their love of flesh are tugging at this body all around, why are you so besotted with it now? Uh, so uh, his first point here is to to consider and think of what will happen when our mind and body separate mind and body will will uh, separate in the future And uh, and when we when mind and body separate, then mind the body is just a, basically a, a, a piece of meat. Our corpse will not be something that our mind will be interested in, or uh, be attached to then. So why should we be so besotted? I think it has to do with being kind of intoxicated or kind of super crazy about our body. We won't be those who will be fighting over eating our bodies. We won't be fighting the worms and bugs because we are still attached to our bodies. Our mind will be, will have to leave our body. Matter of fact, the Tibetan word for body, lu, means something left, something left behind. So our body is by nature something that our mind will leave behind. Why, O oh mind, do you protect this body, taking it to be your own? You and it are each a separate entity. However, can it be of use to you? So this uh, this mind here, of course, it means a dualistic mind. Uh, we've had many bodies throughout our time in samsara. Every lifetime, every every incarnation, or every lifetime, our mind has has uh, been uh, involved with. Uh, has had some 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 kind of body. We've had many bodies, and every one of them we've left behind. And it's this uh, dualistic mind that is the source of attachment to our bodies. And. Uh, this dualistic mind, as soon as we uh, entered into the womb, our dualistic mind began thinking of that little mass of, of things in the womb. It began thinking of it as mine. And uh, so if our mind and our body are two separate, basically what he's saying here is mind and body are two separate entities. They're not the same thing. And so why should we cling to our bodies when we can't take it with us? 
we have to leave it behind. So this is one, one meditation. So these are, this is uh, what Shantideva is presenting here are, are th reflections or thought processes that we should be uh, talking to. Basically you have one, there's a thought that treasures the body and then there's the remedial thought that cuts through holding the body uh, this holding the body as as being uh, uh precious and so you're it's sort of the uh this remedial thoughts versus our clinging habit thoughts kind of verses so you your mind is uh, uh mind is talking on the one hand that it treasures the body and so what the meditation is to be talking to that mind and trying to present to that mind that treasures the body how illogical it is to continue so you're kind of antidoting this habit of uh, uh, of holding the mind as being dear through uh, awareness through your prajna through wisdom, through the ability of your mind to be reasonable and logical. So on the 61st, six, verse 61, uh, he's answering the, the, the question that, not the question, the, the statement that mind will make is, well, uh, mind thinks it needs a support. It needs a support. And then if you think you need a home, this mind needs a home, then uh, why, he says, why, oh foolish mind, don't you appropriate a clean form carved in wood? How is it fit to guard an unclean engine for the making of impurity? And so, um, so here, this is a, this one is, uh, it's interesting. This one is very interesting to me because it kind of put here. He's saying, basically, if if you really need a support, why are you picking on something that is so troublesome? Why are you picking on something that's so uh, unclean as a body? It's constantly in a state of kind of decay. You eat and you extract the nutrients from it, and then the rest of it fills up your body, and it's things that are impure and kind of causes disease that you have to eliminate. Uh, why don't you have something that's sort of uh, like fresh and say that this is my body? Uh, And then this, there's, there's some reference here to this one sutra, Mahayana Sutra, of how the, the body uh, is, the, uh, the body has these 80,000 different kinds of bacteria in them. And, uh, and they, they break down uh, the pure essence and the body receives that nutrition. And then these bacteria create uh, waste products basically and then they those waste products have to be uh, sent out through the through your anus and some waste products come out of your nose some from your eyes some from your ears some from your mouth we have these nine uh, nine holes and uh, so basically he's saying here why don't you appropriately clean from carved in wood reminded me of, of uh, uh, Pinocchio. You know? Why, you know, why not? Because that doesn't have, doesn't have this kind of a impure process. We have this idea that there's something about our body that's sort of inherently or that, well, deep down inside our body is kind of 
pure and wholesome. And so he's there, he's, he's, starting, he's starting to make a, uh, a case against that and how illogical that is. And it also, now I'm kind of interjecting my own kind of when I was thinking of this about how, uh, why, you know, he said here a clean form carved in wood also, why? Uh, uh, anyway, it got me thinking about robots and how. Uh, why don't we uh, uh, take a, a? Why doesn't consciousness, or how could consciousness uh, become attached to uh, to robots? Uh, they don't have. They're not. Uh, you know, they're very kind of clean in a way compared to a human body. And. Uh, Anyway, I won't. I won't go on about that. that now that's me and my uh, unwisdom mind, kind of contemplating the future of uh, the future of Dharma and the future of uh, of humans, um, because its consciousness is separate from the body that it inhabits. And it's mind that uh, awakens. And then there are certain faculties and conditions, coincidental conditions that allow that mind to basically practice mindfulness and introspection. Anyway, you can think about that if you want to. I don't. I don't know. That's a extra. What do you call it? That's that's extra. But I mean, it's not. If if somebody was going to write this now, I wonder if that's not what. Why wouldn't they say something like that? That's what I was thinking at the time. Um. Then. Uh, Number the next one, 62, he's presenting a meditation uh, that basically is sort of a mental autopsy on whether or not this feeling we have of this sort of wholesome purity that lurks or that is at the core of our uh, incarnation, of our core of our body, is actually true or not, if there's any basis for it. And so he says, First, with mind's imagination, uh, which is prajna, uh, shed the covering of skin. So peel away with your mind, with this knife of your mind, uh, the skin, your skin, and then look and see if there's anything there that has, that lives up to the uh, purity that we think of when we think of our body as a possession of our mind. And then with the blade of wisdom further then strip away the flesh from off the frame and look. I said look and smell and examine and see what these parts actually are. Kind of mentally kind of spread them out Maybe you spread them out on your uh, kitchen table or something as a meditation and, and, and really take a look at them. Uh, examine each and every detail. When you, when you have, then next one, when you have uh, divided all the bones and searched right down amid the very marrow, so all the muscles and the ligaments and uh, uh, all the details, then ask the question, where is its essential core? Where is it that you get to where you can say, okay, this is the core of body. And see whether or not there is any essence there that is desirable or that it is something to be attached to. Really look. to see if there's something to cling to. 
that provides a basis for this tendency we have and habit we have to cling to the body. Uh, if uh, persisting in the search, in other words, if uh, with our mind, our dualistic mind, we should uh, uh, carry out this, uh, this meditation, this search for many days, you know, after doing this for some time, for some days, uh, then when you see that there is no underlying or desirable essence, then uh, ask your mind, why do you protect with such uh, attachment, with such desire, the body that you now possess? Uh, the point here being that the body is only purpose is to practice the Dharma, to practice virtue to practice bodhicitta. That's the only purpose for it. There is nothing about the body that gives it any sort of meaning or value beyond as a vehicle to awaken bodhicitta, to practice bodhicitta and to perfect bodhicitta and virtue and benefit beings. Uh, it's a vehicle used to reach liberation, enlightenment. So that is the, well, you should come to that when you, when you do that meditation and, and come to the end point where you find nothing there to cling to, then counsel yourself to thinking in terms of, of what meaning this body has. Then, then we're talking about a precious human body. You can see then the difference between just having a human body and being attached to it and having a precious human body. A precious human body uh, doesn't imply that you have this inordinate attachment to it. Uh, then in the commentary, it mentions how, uh, like, People who have not uh, taken the bodhisattva or bodhicitta vow, people who aren't practicing bodhicitta and are not, who don't really have any precepts to guard. So we're, what we're talking, the context there is, how do we not allow, how do we not, how do we prevent our bodhicitta and the training in bodhicitta from degenerating? That's what the point of this, that's the context. So if you don't have, if you're not training in bodhicitta, then you have no precepts. So these, 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 uh, there's no reason for you to overcome your attachment to your body. And there's no reason to, to, to be taught these because there's no context for it. It's, it's weird. The context, uh, without the context, it doesn't make any sense. It's unnecessary even. It's irrelevant. There's this category of, of teachings in Dharma called irrelevant teachings. And irrelevant teachings has to do with context. So here we should really appreciate uh, the relevancy of this by placing it within the context of of bodhicitta. We must know the reason that we're practicing this. It's not, this is not, uh, say, the Buddhist Dharma that we should memorize so that we know the Dharma, the doctrine of the Buddha. Okay, this is a, there's a context for this. Uh, so then mind, our habit mind is persistent and it still says, well, even though the body is, is kind of dirty and impure, I still need a body. And then 
you should tell yourself, tell your mind, that mind, the, the habit clinging to your body mind, then your prajna mind, your wisdom mind should tell that uh, uh, habit clinging, clinging habit, habit clinging body mind. Should I, I should have drawn a chart here, so I, you should uh, ask that uh, uh, mind that treasures the body. Well, uh, it's you can't eat it, O oh mind. It says it's filth. You cannot eat, O oh mind. Its blood likewise is not for you to drink. Its innards too are unsuitable to suck. Then. You don't need it. You just think you need it, mind. Uh, it says, this body, then what will you make of it? It has no use to you, mind. Its only use is to practice virtue. You can't eat it. You can't drink it. You can't do any of the things. Okay, so that's, uh, that. then you, you answer that. So here, you're, you know, you're, you're basically... Uh, replacing delusion with prajna, with, uh, with knowledge. And then uh, Shantideva goes on to uh, speak in kind of a very ironic, almost contemptuous way. And he says here, uh, and yet it may indeed be kept as food to feed the vultures and the fox. So he says, well, uh, from the point of view of, the, from another point of view, yeah, this body is valuable. Uh, you could offer it to the wild animals. Then there'd be some benefit. The value of this human form lies only in the use you make of it. Uh, and we're talking about the difference between having a human body and having a precious human body. A precious human body is one where we have uprooted attachment. And again, it's a very gradual process. It's not like throwing the attachment switch off. We need to practice. And this kind of contemplation is a way to actually reduce our attachment to it. While at the same time, we won't necessarily notice that we that our attachment to our body is reduced. All we'll notice is that we don't have so many problems practicing virtue, practicing dharma. Because you, you examine your own self, your life, and see if you can finger, if you can... Uh, if you can uh, identify how much your body and your concern with your body prevents you from practicing. So we must, he says here, we uh, have such a strong attachment to our body. As a matter of fact, our attachment to our body, we hardly even know we have an attachment to our body. We're so blinded or so, so, uh, uh, so attached that we don't even know we're attached to it. So this is what we need to start examining. So and we must do it sort of in a gradual way. It's kind of an unwinding. It's kind of an unwinding process. Like Chapter Drumpuche talked about how we're, it's like we're bound up with coils of ropes with knots and we can't move. And then we just have to make our fingers move and just not and un, just untie one knot first. And then we can untie another one. And then, you know, one after the other, we have all these knots. It doesn't happen just by like 
like Superman or, you know, it happens like one, one knot at a time like that. That is the, the path of the Bodhisattva. See, Bodhisattva path has to be, it has to be gradual like this so that it becomes authentic because we are in the world. We are not suddenly becoming a, a, a spiritual, a Buddhist practitioner, a Dharma practitioner who just, who shaves their head, gives away all their possessions and becomes a nun or a monk. Suddenly a radical lifestyle change. And emphasizing controlling your your physical and verbal conduct. Uh, we're not, we're out there, you know. Uh, of course, I don't know everybody here actually, but uh, uh, the Bodhisattva path, uh, like even if we have the outer <laughs> comportment of a, of a monk or a nun, then our inner life is in the world as a bodhisattva. And someone who's looking at you from the outside as a monk or a nun, they may think you're a, a full <laughs> a renunciate. Uh, and that's, that's the message that you are conveying in, a, uh, in an exter external way. But inwardly, you are with everyone and you are feeling everything that everyone is feeling and you are on the bodhisattva path and you are uncovering your mental habits one by one in this fashion. Uh, okay, so we should realize then uh, in this precious human by birth, you know, that you know, uh, we shouldn't just regard our body as, uh, or, or regard our life as, as just a process of sustaining our body. Especially now. And uh, the end. Keep in mind that the end of our life, this body will always decay. So we must find the meaning of this body. We must find what's called, we must find the precious human body. And the precious human body implies a mind that is not attached to that body, but uses this body, okay? Whatever we may, whatever you may do to guard and keep it, what will you do when the ruthless Lord of Death will seize and throw it <clears throat> to the dogs and birds? Okay, so now we, uh, now he's uh, <laughs> talking about, and we should reflect again in this way, uh, in this sequential practice about how uh, our life is now ending. As soon as we're born, you know, one point of view is as soon as we're born, we begin the death process. Uh, and uh, we're using our intelligence and our attachment to guard our, our body and our habit of guarding and protecting and indulging. Oh, indul not intelligence, indulging. I have my notes was in the, there. It's, we're, it's, if we are, because of our, if we guard and keep our body with, with by indulging in it, and this is like, you know, too much obsessing and always being worried about the looks of our body and so forth. 
and or if our health, you know, has a very, you know, we kind of a very narrow corridor of what we accept our body as feeling, you know, is a kind of a uh, attachment to having body always on a on a kind of a straight course from morning to night, day after day. We should always feel completely in tune. This is being attached uh, to our body and, and paying too much attention to it. Uh, in the end, at the, like it says, ruthless Lord of death. Of course, the Lord of death, the Yama, uh, means uh, time. The Lord of death is time. The time of our death. And at the time when, that when our time to die comes, it's ruthless, meaning that uh, at the time of our death, there's no love, there's no forgiveness, there's no, there's no giving you a second chance. There's, there's death. It's just. And so, uh, whatever we, whatever method or to whatever we assign our body to uh, at, at when our mind and body separate, uh, then what will you do if you're always uh, worried about how your body is or feels or looks? So uh, think about this, like uh, in the ultimate sense here you're going through these different contemplations here but then also then the contemplation which i'm sure you're familiar with uh, in the contemplations of impermanence and how uh, uh, all birth ends in death there's no there's no sort of plan b there's only one end of birth and that's death and when you die uh, three things happen. First, you can't take any of your possessions with you. Uh, second, you can't take any of you can't uh, take any of your friends with you. And third, you can't take your body with you. And suffering, the suffering at death comes based on one of the primary sufferings at death is attachment to possessions. So we learn to give our possessions away to make sure that you have the paperwork of what happens so that you don't uh, feel the affliction of attachment to your possessions at death and your body. So here we're getting you know, further teachings on how to uproot this attachment to our body and direct it towards the meaning of the body, what might be thought of as the essence of, of this life. When we die, think about how we die. Death is not other than when we stop breathing and our heart stops. Usually we breathe in and then we breathe out. And then we breathe in, then we breathe out. Uh, and when we don't breathe in again, then that's a point of death. Then the heart will stop. Okay, that. So this body, we have to leave it behind. Uh, then, uh, Number 68. Uh, if servants who cannot be set to work are not rewarded with supplies and clothing, why do you sustain with such great pains this body which, though nourished, will abandon you? So here, uh, uh, the premise for this verse uh, is how our mind seems to be unaware that 
our body will leave us in the end. And we care for it and take care of it as if, as if it won't. But yet, if we, of course, uh, uh, if we have, if we, uh, you know, hire someone to do a job for us, and they don't do it, uh, then we we won't we won't pay them. And so here we're basically we're paying our body, but it's not going to stay with us. It will abandon us, just like someone who wants to get paid for a job and then you pay them and then they just walk away. That's what our body will do. Uh, so uh, we should uh, wonder why are we care, why are we so obsessive about caring for our body? It's not going to go with us when our mind goes on our journey to the next life. It will be left behind. So again, these contemplations are punctuating how uh, our attachment needs to be antidoted with, with uh, clear-headed logic and, and uh, wisdom, basically knowledge. As it says in the commentary, our mind just seems completely unaware that our body will leave us the way that it's treating it. Our mind will continue, but our body will not. So here in this last uh, verse of this of this uh, practice, he says that so. Uh, so pay this body due renew, remuneration, and then be sure to make it work for you. But do not lavish everything on what will not bring perfect benefit. <clears throat> uh, oh, There's one more verse after this one, but here, uh, what he's saying here uh, points to how we should avoid being, you know, the Buddhist path as Buddha Shakyamuni uh, taught in the, the very first teaching he gave was to avoid extremes. Like in Buddha's lifetime, his first part of his life was one of complete indulgence and pursuing and fulfilling of sensory pleasures that originate and are experienced in the body. And then he broke from that, as we know, and then he went on this whole other extreme path of uh, hardships and uh, penance and so forth. And his message is, was when he attained enlightenment is uh, to follow the middle way and not to fall into extremes of, of uh, sense gratifications or extreme uh, deprivation, sensual sense deprivation but to follow the middle path. Uh, just uh, eat food and clothe yourself in ways that will support your body as it practices virtue. Uh, don't beat it up or cause it to uh, struggle beyond its capacity. Although I, I do, so, you know, a young day now and then is a good thing. Uh, and people who have done uh, a lot of young days, uh, uh, I know at, at our Trongbe Bompa in Tibet and so forth, there are practitioners there who, who turned Nyune into their uh, a lifelong practice, just but their body 
uh, became gradually adjusted to a complete uh, liquid and solid food fast uh, every every other day, and it just became a, an easy lifestyle, which many people find after uh, stringing uh, a number of nyungnes together. Uh, so pay the time and be sure to make it work for you. So, uh, but don't lavish, don't, don't lavish everything on what will not bring perfect benefit. That is to say, uh, our purpose is to establish all sentient beings in a state of liberation from suffering and enlightenment. And so maintain your body for that purpose. And considering that it may take a bit of time to do that, then we should also, uh, like on what will not bring perfect benefit, also refers to our mind's future uh, lives. And again, you, we have to not, uh, we have to be, uh, not fall into the extremes of being judgmental about uh, what are called in Buddhist language kind of ordinary people, people who have not taken refuge, who are not kind of passionate about attaining enlightenment, who are not uh, necessarily uh, driven by a motivation uh, that includes the scope of all sentient beings as, as does the uh, bodhisattva uh, mind, the mind of the bodhisattva. Uh, so uh, uh, especially as beginning bodhisattvas, we both have to uh, avoid being uh, influenced, influenced, overly influenced by, uh, by ordinary people and also we need to avoid being influenced in judging ordinary people, but always being uh, kind and considerate and respectful to others. And also being humble. And I think this kind of contemplation and the uh, difficulty of this contemplation I might be like just it's, it might be intellectually it, it works, but for people like us, modern people, who are also kind of very uh, we have more heightened emotional uh, life. Uh, the, one of the qualities, not quality, yeah, quality. One of the characteristics of the degenerate age that you know this gets worse, that gets worse, the air, the environment gets worse, the water gets worse, uh, but all the clashes actually get more. Clashes get more, more better. Our attachment is better than you know, more. So that's our time period is like that. So we're much. It's it's much more uh, scary and maybe challenging to to uh, talk to ourselves like this for a fee, with uh, for fear of what the outcomes will be. But certainly, uh, things aren't working out that well. And our Dharma practice is pretty challenged most of the time and our, our aspirations. But what this kind of contemplation does is that it, it brings our aspirations and our capacity closer together. Because this attachment to the body is so uh, pivotal in our uh, there's is such an obstacle to our practice. Think about it. Really think about it. Uh, so here, 70, then uh, regard your body as a vessel. It's a support for the Dharma. Maintain this body to the extent that serves uh, this function. Think of your body as having a, a function. It has an actual meaning. 
the meaning of the body is not in the body, but the meaning of the body is in the mind that should be running the body, not the other way around. Bodies shouldn't be running the mind. That's one thing we learn in, in doing nyungnes is how you had no idea that our body was influencing such control over our mind. So we're trying to turn it the other way around, to correct, to bring our mind into its correct stance, its correct point of view. Uh, regard your body as a vessel, a simple boat for going here and there. Uh, make of it a thing that answers every wish to bring about the benefit of beings. Make of it a, a body, make this body into a Buddha body, an enlightened body, so that whoever sees that body, whoever hears, uh, thinks of, or touches, or remembers uh, that body, just like when you see the, the image of a Buddha, that it benefits brings about the benefit of beings. Uh, I say that uh, attaining enlightenment, then happen, you know, then there's enlightened, uh, enlightened uh, body, speech, and mind. You know, there's dharmakaya, sambhogakaya, nirmanakaya, there's form kayas and the formless kayas, the dharmakaya and the rupakayas. So there is a manifestation that occurs at enlightenment. And so we want to take this, this flesh and blood body we have now, find its meaning, practice the Bodhisattva path to transform this flesh and blood body into the form kaya. It will become a, like a, what's called a wish fulfilling jewel whoever sees, hears, touches, remembers, and so forth. Uh, so we should uh, focus, we'll train, train our minds to focus on the two kinds of bodhicitta, to have, have this mind that has this noble intention one that focuses on the fruit of enlightenment. The fruition is enlightenment. That is aspiration, bodhicitta. It means you're focusing on the fruit. And, and bodhicitta that focuses on the, the cause or the seed, uh, of the seed of enlightenment is engaging bodhicitta. So at first we train in aspiration bodhicitta and then we try to practice as much as we can focusing on the, the roots or the cause of enlightenment which are the paramitas, the six perfections. And if we continue to cultivate this intention, this one-pointed intention, this focus of attention on attaining enlightenment, both from our own point of view and also from the point of view of others, you know, we, we say, well, may all sentient, may all beings uh, attain enlightenment. We say that at the end of our, or maybe we have that as on our uh, emails, our signature file, you know, may all beings attain enlightenment. Well, that's focusing on the, the fruit, even the, the four measurables when we contemplate uh, may all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness, which is virtue. May all beings be free of suffering and may they be free of the causes of suffering, which is a negative actions. Uh, and these kinds of 
uh, aspiration, contemplations, equanimity, joy, and so forth. Uh, those are all uh, uh, the practice of bodhicitta that focuses on the fruit, the fruition, enlightenment, temporarily as happiness and ultimately as enlightenment. Then when we focus on the bodhicitta, uh, the bodhicitta uh, uh, of the engaging bodhicitta, we focus on the cause, then we're focusing on the paramitas and the underlying motivation of engaging bodhicitta with the paramitas is this aspiration bodhicitta. So as the, in the mind training, then we train in aspiration bodhicitta, and then we discover how to uh, get used to that. We get used to that aspiration bodhicitta so that we can engage in the paramitas without blocking it out or without forgetting about it. That's why we always um, make aspiration bodhicitta our practice first. Then when we practice generosity, it will be motivated by this aspiration. Then we're talking about the merging of the coming together of, of the two bodhicittas. Okay, so... Uh, that's how we should uh, conduct ourselves. And uh, that's what will replace our present attachment to our body. As long as we're attached to our body and we don't address that, that attachment, thinking that we're not really attached to our body, uh, then this bodhicitta will become uh, difficult. And so here, Shantideva in this chapter, which is in the section of the overall section of how to not lose bodhicitta once it's arisen. So think of the context and then kind of go through the, uh, the mechanics of these kinds of thinking. Okay. Uh -oh. So I think we'll end at this point. Uh, I where I am, I'm in Seattle, and I think that my computer is going to go off any second. Uh, so uh, I will uh, say goodbye.